Um, welcome everyone to um, the uh, penultimate lecture on the subject of um, uh, copyrights and trademarks. Um, we have one more lecture to go covering copyrights and trademarks, and next week I'm going to get right into patents, utility, design, animal patents. So there's just a couple of things I wanted to cover um, uh, that are left over, so to speak, with respect to uh, copyrights and trademarks. Before I, got in, I get into that, I have a couple of housekeeping things that I need to um, cover. First of all, um, today is Thursday the 22nd. Tomorrow, Friday, uh, I just want to remind everyone that the papers uh, are due, uh, and what I, might, what I mean by that is the abstract of the uh, topic that you have decided uh, to write a paper on uh, for credit uh, this semester are, is due tomorrow. Um, you should submit them on the Stellar site. Uh, Brian will review them to make sure that um, they are uh, sufficiently narrow and tailored. Uh, and if uh, there's any feedback necessary, I assume Brian will provide that to you. So that deadline is tomorrow. Don't forget that deadline. Um, it's one of the few deadlines you have to be concerned about in the class. The second thing is I have passed out to you again today uh, a uh, questionnaire, as I did last week. I'm finding that your feedback terribly valuable. Um, and you know this is MIT, data, data, data. So the more data points I have, the better I can uh, shape this course uh, in a way that is most, uh, resonates most with you. So I, I'm asking you, I'm begging, with, begging you, I'm pleading with you, whoever hasn't uh, done these before, please take a few minutes and you can either do it online in an email to me uh, or you can fill out the, uh, the, the analog version I've handed out. Um, you can do it anonymous, anonymously, I don't need your names. I just want your feedback and your questions. Like I said, I'm trying to shape this course in a way that uh, is, uh, resonates with you folks and um, your, your input is terribly valuable to me in that regard. Um, and, and also, again, it's anonymous. Tell me what you like, what you don't like about uh, the presentations. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm all ears when it comes to constructive uh, criticism and feedback. If there are things about the way I lecture this course uh, or present this material that you think can be improved, by all means, um, I have uh, no ego in this game. I'm, uh, I'm here actually uh, to um, essentially lead the discussion. Remember what we talked about. Education is the accidental byproduct of discussion fueled by curiosity. And so it's the discussion part of this that I really am, um, see myself as leading. And the more feedback uh, that I get from you folks, the better off I am. By the way, I, that, that, uh, that phrase is trademarked. Uh, education being the accidental byproduct of uh, discussion fueled by curiosity. So, uh, but anyone who wants to use it in this class is free to use it. All right, there's a few things I wanted to cover. Again, getting back to the questions that uh, uh, I've been receiving from you folks online uh, and after class. Uh, when we left off last uh, uh, week, um, we were talking about overlapping protection. And by the way, I think I told you I've prepared this uh, very carefully designed uh, syllabus and uh, lecture presentation materials uh, featuring this carefully researched uh, PowerPoint. Um, but because of the way you folks have, uh, have led the class through your questioning, I've taken things out of order. But believe it or not, uh, we've actually covered everything that I intended to cover by the syllabus, just taking my, my lead from you. Uh, and so the last thing we talked about were ov was overlapping protection, uh, or examples of overlapping protection. And I wanted to finally uh, uh, do a little bit more illustrating of that point, because I got some questions about it. And by the way, don't let the silly logos and uh, cartoons I put up on the uh, board uh, uh, fool you. Uh, while they are hopefully entertaining and uh, help the material sink in, you know, these trademarks, uh, some of them are worth uh, uh, you know, 50, 60, 100 million dollars. Uh, does anybody know what the, I had a couple of Coke bottles in here last week. 
you know, Coca-Cola is a, a $90 billion corporation. Uh, and while their trademarks or, or the trademarks of uh, Looney Tunes owned by Warner Brothers uh, may seem silly or, uh, or casual, uh, let me assure you that uh, this is uh, uh, as, as serious as a heart attack. Uh, and uh, uh, I simply choose to use these illustrations because I think they, it makes the, the material go down smoother. So anyhow, um, anybody familiar with this particular uh, uh, logo? Uh, at least one person's old enough to, to remember uh, this logo. I grew up. Uh, listening to this thing. And as a matter of fact, I, it's probably the only song that was sounding in my head for the first, you know, 15 years of my life. Um, there was a time when there was television that had only three channels. Uh, my parents owned a Dumont. Um, uh, you'll have to look that up. Um, but um, uh, there were three channels and on one of them, it was Looney Tunes all day, all night. Um, but this uh, is an is a excellent example of overlapping intellectual property protection. Because the Looney Tunes theme song has been registered as a trademark uh, by Time Warner, but it's also copyrighted. Remember we talked about overlapping protection and how you can sometimes make an end run around the limitations uh, uh, for the terms of different intellectual property. And as intellectual property becomes uh, more homogenized, uh, the, same t the same type of, of um, logo or depiction or creative work can be covered by more than one uh, type of intellectual property protection. So um, uh, this one in particular is not only copyrighted, uh, but it is also uh, trademarked by uh, Warner Brothers, uh, or by, excuse me, by Time Warner. Um, and trademarks, as we know, are forever, uh, so long as you continue to renew them and use them in commerce continuously. Uh, the minute a trademark is abandoned, it goes into the public domain. Uh, but so long as you uh, register it and you continuously use it in commerce, um, that uh, the term of a trademark, trademark protection lasts forever. Um, this particular uh, uh, trademark and copyright, the Looney Tunes song, was, uh, I'm sure as you all know, first sung by uh, Daffy Duck uh, in the uh, famous uh, cartoon short, Daddy Duck and Egghead in 1938. It actually is a little bit like Happy Birthday, because the Looney Tunes song was uh, really an amalgam of several songs from the uh, early uh, 20th century. Uh, but it was uh, copyrighted in 1938 by its, um, uh, by its creator. Um, now, as time has gone on, the tune has changed. And this gets back to some of the questions I've received. How different does uh, an item of uh, intellectual property have to be in order to uh, qualify for separate trademark or copyright protection? And the answer is, not very much. So for instance, um, the original copyright for um, the Looney Tunes version of this song that appeared in Daddy Duck and Egghead uh, in 1938 would have run out when? What's the term of a copyright? 70 years. So 70 years plus 1938, uh, that copyright had, has, has expired. And, it, and, this, uh, and that particular version of the song uh, fell into the public domain. And you can use it, uh, download it, uh, uh, and um, make whatever use you want of the song at this point. Um, but as time went on, the song changed. Um, Daffy also sang a special, specially modified version of the song in um, Boobs in the Woods in 1950. It was a modified version of the song, a separate arrangement, different lyrics, different copyright. So do you think this is accidental, by the way? Do you think that, that 
that the way, remember we went over the, the Coca-Cola trademarks, and which are both copyrighted and trademarked, okay? Remember the, the term is 70 years. Well, isn't it interesting that every couple of decades, what they do is they update their trademarks or their copyrights, their logos, or they update their songs. New song in 1950, new copyright. So the clock restarts. Uh, the tune also made appearances in the Merry Melodies shorts uh, Sweet Sue, Jungle Jitters, and Aviation Vacation in the 1950s. I don't think any of those cartoons, if you've ever seen them, uh, you can Google them if you want. I don't think any of those would see the light of day if they were uh, shown, uh, or if they were created today. Um, they reflect um, a whole different attitude uh, of society. But again, 1963, a new variation of the theme was arranged by a fellow by the name of William Lava for use in the updated opening sequences of the new Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies uh, uh, shorts, uh, and they actually sort of converge. Mel Merry Melodies and Looney Tunes con converge. But again, 1963, new version of the song, new copyright protection. Right. So how does it work if, with movies and television shows when they do a reboot, so like coming out with like a new version of, it, of all these shows from the 80s, Magnum P.I. and Hawaii Five O and all this all these shows from the 70s and 80s are now being rebooted. Do the people who created the original show get money for that? If the original show is still uh, under copyright, uh, and a lot of them are, uh, because 70 years is a long time, pl plus the, the, the life of the, of, of the author, um, they pay, they, in most cases, will pay a licensing fee. Um, in other cases, uh, movie, lots of movies, Lots of these cartoons have, have fallen into the public domain because either the trademark uh, has been abandoned, the copyright has been expired, um, uh, and so much time has gone on that, um, that they, they simply are part of the public domain. A lot of movies are in the public domain. A lot of movies that you've heard of, that you've probably uh, read about or even seen, uh, are in the public domain. Uh, and, and there's a whole body of law out there that deals just with creative works and their age and so forth. But the rules are the same for whether it's Gone with the Wind or Looney Tunes or the you know, uh, Coca-Cola jingle, uh, 70 years for copyright uh, and trademarks are forever, so long as they're not abandoned. Uh, anyhow, uh, finishing the, uh, the, the, the idea, um, the song was revised again. Uh, that's a typo there. It's not he song. It's uh, the song was revised again when um, the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit um, uh, was, um, uh, was, uh, was made. Again, you know, who cares about Who Framed Roger Rabbit and, you know, um, Daddy Duck and Egghead? Uh, these, these examples may seem trivial or uh, casual to you. But uh, they illustrate the concepts, uh, and it's the same whether it's a, a, a you know, computer program, a, a, a book on material science. Uh, the, the concepts are all the same. I only use these concepts to, to illustrate. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yes. When you do that, do you claim all the characters? A great example of, of overlapping protection. There, there are various intellectual property protections for each short, for instance. So um, not only do you own the image of Bugs Bunny, but you own the character as, the, as so you own the graphic depiction, but you also own the textual depiction of Bugs Bunny, his character, so to speak, his characteristics, uh, some of the things that he says, like, what's up, Doc? That makes um, uh, Bugs Bunny unique. And, and it's the same, it's no different than when you write a computer program. And, 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 you, and you may be using um, uh, uh, some form of software um, that pre-existed, but if you change it and give it unique character, 
give it a what's up doc, okay, or suffering succotash, as Do Donald Duck says, make it unique and it's, a, and it's separately, uh, you can protect it separately. It, that's the originality requirement that we talked about last time. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot, uh, surprisingly, especially with software uh, and uh, materials processes. If you can think of a streamline, a way of streamlining a process or improving it, uh, even slightly, that's separately protectable, okay? It's as different, well, I'll give you an example. Old Daffy, separate copyright, separate trademark. New Daffy, completely separate copyright, completely separate trademark. They're the same character but they're different. And this is an example of the originality requirement. You can see this, uh, this fella here, um, completely different than the, than the attitude projected by this fellow. And so it's not only a graphic depiction, but it's the, it's, it's the image that is projected, the, the personality conveyed by the image. That qualifies as original content. Yes, Brian. Um, what's this? You mean? So, sure. So you know how? Let's say they made they made a Smurfs movie. Smurfs was a cartoon show in the eighties, and they made like the CGI version. Yep. So is there a separate? One for the two versions. Absolutely. I don't know that a CGI version of Daffy Duck has been made, but if one has been made or if one is going to be made, it's separately copyrightable. And it may be, if it, if it shows any differences, any updates, you know, he has a little band around his neck in this one. Look at the difference in the band around his neck here. One's a long band, one's a short band. An example, and if you got into a court of law, and if there was a fight over, the, over an infringement action, that's the kind of stuff that we'd be talking about. Measuring the band, the way his bill curves, uh, the, the, the pose that he takes, the position of his feet. All of those things are what go into making these uniquely original and protectable. No different with software. No different than with a materials process. You have to show that it's different but not a lot different in order to uh, satisfy the original, originality requirement. Yes, sir? So if the, if the old Daffy had expired copyright and the new Daffy had not expired, I could separately produce a different Daffy that was based off of the old Daffy but sufficiently distinct from the new Daffy, and that would be legal? The key is sufficiently distinct. With a trademark that's this powerful, um, you really have to create some distance between you and the established character because this is so strongly associated in the minds uh, of the public with a particular product, you've got to really distinguish it. But n uh, not all ducks are owned by Warner. So if you can come up with a duck which is different not only graphically, but in the character that it, um, that it projects. It can't talk with a, with a heavy lift like, like, like Daffy does. But, if, but if, you could, if you could make the character unique, you could, you could use it as your logo. But similarities with the old one that had expired would be OK. Yes. Because that has expired. Yes. This, this guy, I believe this guy, this guy is in the public domain. They, they, and, and there's a reason for that. Want or just abandon it? They're they're tired of this character. Um, you don't know, you don't you you don't see Warner selling any children's toys with this guy attached to it. What they've decided is, from a marketing standpoint, this is the more powerful and influential character, and so this is the one they protect, and this is the one they've abandoned. Poor old Daffy is uh, belongs to us all now, um, and it's the same with any piece of intellectual property software, anything that you create, if you abandon it, if you stop using it, Brian, if you stop using your trade name in commerce for any appreciable period of time, usually three or four years, and I mean you have to show a use in commerce, uh, not just 
So you have to publish it in a pamphlet. You have to use it on checks. You have to put it on a sign. Exactly. You have to show a use in commerce or it's considered abandoned. You, you, you can't just put it in your back pocket and forget about it. Otherwise, it falls into the public domain. Uh, another example of uh, overlapping protection. Uh, everybody's heard of the Harlem Globetrotters. Everybody knows the song Sweet Georgia Brown. Well, not only is the song, was the song copyrighted uh, uh, and protected that way, but it's also uh, considered the registered trademark of the Harlem Globetrotters. Overlap overlapping protection. Um, we talked about how we, in, copy, in, in, trade, in, in intellectual property law, the, the, there's always this balance between the rights of the creators to monetize and profit by their invention and the right of the public um, to benefit and enjoy uh, the, the, uh, the results of that uh, industry and creativity. Um, that's why there are terms, limits, uh, to how long intellectual property rights are protected. Um, and when it comes with overlapping protection, we start getting into you know, um, problems uh, with this balance. Because while a particular mark, like the Looney Tune mark, um, is covered for, for uh, 70 years, by protecting it as a trademark as well, you can actually protect it forever and thereby deprive the public of the benefit of that forever or indefinitely. Um, and when it comes to Looney Tunes and Donald Duck, that probably doesn't matter that much. But when it comes to other forms of intellectual property, the discussion becomes more serious. Uh, but as time goes on and uh, things like uh, uh, so many more things can, can fall in to trademark and copyright, uh, the, the trademark and copyright protections. Um, we start getting close to the point where we're upsetting this balance that we've struck uh, between society's right to know and benefit and profit from uh, and build upon the, um, the knowledge of others. Uh, and the inventiveness of others, and the creator's right to enjoy their, um, uh, their um, uh, creative uh, inventions. Give you an example um, uh, that applies to material science. Um, what did um, Tesla do with their um, lithium uh, battery technology? Build the, they build the best battery. They build the best battery in the entire world when it comes to uh, autom automobiles, electric automobiles. What do they do with that technology? Anybody know? Did they make it public? Exactly. Why do you think they made it public? They wanted other people to kind of join the game, so they weren't the only ones. Bingo. Exactly. Um, they could have held on to that technology uh, for a long time, uh, and it would have. Uh, appropriately deprived anyone else of the opportunity to profit by it or even build on it. So Tesla owns the patent, you're chairman of Ford Motor Company, you're chairman of General Motors, the board is coming to you and say, we need electric cars. What do you do? You say, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. Tesla owns the patent on that technology, I'm not going to invest a billion dollars to come up with something similar and then get sued by Tesla. I'm not building electric cars. Tesla saw this. And Tesla turned all their, all their uh, inventions uh, over to the public so that anybody could use it. Their theory being um, the, when, the, when, the, when the water rises, it floats all the boats. And Tesla wanted Tesla decided it was more important to expand the market for um, uh, electric automobiles than it was to keep it narrow and own the, and own the technology. Toyota has done the same thing. Uh, Ford has done the same thing. Um, when they see um, that siloing a particular technology actually is not in their long-term best interest, corporations oftentimes turn this stuff over to the public domain. Does that work um, with respect to the service side of it? Or is Tesla still Careful. the only OEM, original equipment manufacturer? Or 
or they are they allowed other companies to come oh yeah so for, for aerospace you have Rolls Royce Pratt and Whitney they're the ones who make the engines the, the OEM. yeah we're, what we're talking about is the granular technology that goes into the lithium batteries that Tesla uses it's not um, it's not um, it's not like a Rolls-Royce engine, okay? It's like the technology that goes into the Rolls-Royce engine is more like the, the carbon fiber fan blades, um, the turbine blades, uh, how, they're, how they're attached, uh, and so forth. It's, it's, the, it's the granular technology that, that goes into it. Tesla is still, you know, uh, you, you can't use the Tesla mark. Um, I can't uh, build a company, I can't start producing Tesla parts and calling them Tesla parts. Um, so they still control all of that patent technology, but the, but the, the basic technology behind the, ba the, the lithium battery is open. Um, all right. Um, and I hope that answers this question that I got from the class, which is how different does something have to be to consider to be considered your IP other than uh, others? Um, I assume we've covered it, right? You can all answer that question right now. The other thing I wanted to cover, because it was fun a couple of weeks ago, and I learned something from it, um, uh, is uh, religious or spiritual works and copyrights. We talked about this, and, and I remember we were talking about the King James Bible, and how can it possibly be copyrighted, and, I think at the time I said there's a special law that covers the King James Bible. I don't know where that information came from, but I walked out of this class wondering about it, uh, and, I saw, and I went out and I researched the cases, uh, and I learned that there's an awful lot about uh, copyright and uh, spiritual works that illustrates, uh, again, basic principles of copy, copyright and trademark law that are important for us to realize and, and internalize. Um, as, as, um, as the slide says, every great religion wants to control its written or spoken uh, uh, testament or uh, the principles by which it uh, uh, identifies itself. Um, but um, as we talked about in that class, uh, copyrights uh, involving religious works are sometimes uh, unclear. Uh, under the Berne Convention and U.S. copyright, it's 70 years. Uh, or in the case of anonymous publications, 95 or 120 years, we've covered all that. But what do you do when your religion says that your book was written by a deity? Who owns the copyright to that? The, the, we talked about the King James Bible. Um, there are many editions of the Bible, uh, uh, and we talked about how if the edition was different than a pre previous edition, it was covered by copyright. This, uh, once again, is the originality requirement uh, being demonstrated. The King James Bible is an English translation of the Christian Bible from, for the Church of England that began in 1604 and completed in 1611. So it's... How long does the copyright last on that? At most, 120 years, right? So you'd think that the, the, um, the King James Bible would be um, in the public domain these days. But um, in the United Kingdom, the King James Bible uh, is uh, covered by a crown copyright. It get re gets renewed periodically. Uh, and, the, 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 and this is literally true, and I don't know who does it for her, but the queen literally has to walk down the street uh, to where the King James Bible is published and pay a fee in order to have the, the, uh, the, the, the Bible republished periodically. Um, under, the, under British um, copyright law, uh, they, the, the crown has to pay that fee annually in order to maintain the copyright to it. And so... This is an example of, I guess you'd call it overlapping protection, because uh, the queen has owned the, uh, the, the rights uh, to the copyright of the King James Bible since uh, it was published in 1604. And as long as she keeps walking down the street and handing that uh, payment to the uh, publisher, 
uh, apparently uh, under British law, it, um, it remains under her control. Um, but I started thinking about other religious texts. And what I found out is that copyright law has saved a number of religions. Um, and again, the principles that were responsible for saving these, these uh, religions are illustrative of principles that apply to material science and, and every other form of intellectual uh, property. Um, anybody familiar with this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures? There's a famous church headquartered in Boston which uh, bases its theology on this text, and that's the Christian Science uh, uh, Church. I believe they, it's called the First Church of Christ Scientist, which is over in um, uh, Back Bay. Mary Baker Eddy uh, was the um, originator of this uh, particular work, and the Christian Science Church has taken a different view than other religions uh, concerning the rights to control her, um, uh, her book. Um, it was first, first published in 1875, so of course the, um, the rights to it, uh, since the author was known, uh, expired 70 years later about, in about 1950. Um, there were several editions uh, to it that uh, each were, of course, uh, separately copyrightable. But uh, by 1971's, uh, all the uh, editions uh, had passed into the public domain. Um, and now the, the, the church allows it to be published by anybody. Um, they're happy that it's in the public domain. And they encourage it to be uh, reproduced and copied and shared. And the reason for that is because they think that it's in the interest of their theology uh, to spread the word in that way. So they're using copyright law, uh, or in this particular instance, the public domain, uh, in order to proselytize or um, uh, spread the word of, uh, of their founder. Um, uh, with respect to um, uh, Christian science, uh, they've had a, a very powerful lobby in Congress for many years, and in 1971, a bill was actually passed in Congress which extended the copyright of science and health to the year 2046. Now who, does that, does that sound a little off to anybody here? Um, well, it is. Uh, we can't make exceptions for anybody under the law. Everyone is equal in the eyes of the law. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, all religious uh, organizations. And in 1984, a federal appeals court uh, uh, struck that law down as unconstitutional, being an uh, impermissible um, uh, uh, establishment of religion. Um, now, this, this came about as a group of church dis because a group of ch church dissidents sued the church. Um, but the, um, the result is uh, uh, illustrative of the fact that um, Copyright law, when, when the term says 70 years, it means 70 years, and Congress can't, can't special, pass a special law for you or anybody else uh, it, extending that, um, uh, that time period. Um, Book of Mormon. Now, believe it or not, copyright actually saved the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, which is based, of course, on uh, uh, the work called the Book of Mormon. The first American edition of the Book of Mormon was published in 1830, followed by another edition published in uh, 1837, both separately copyrightable, okay? And the first excerpts of the Book of Mormon in the United States were published by uh, an, uh, an opponent of the church. So um, what they did is they took the Book of Mormon and changed it around and tinkered with the tenets of the church uh, to suit their particular, um, I guess, religious point of view. And the Book of Mormon, or the Church of Latter-day Saints, sued the, uh, the heretic, as, as uh, they referred to uh, this publisher at the time, and they stopped the publication of the Book of Mormon uh, in what they considered to be an adulterated form. Um, but Religions are not 
bound by geography, and there was a problem that the, that the Church of Latter-day Saints had when it came to the publication of their work, although protected in the United States, overseas. And um, so it became the responsibility of, um, has anyone ever heard of, um, of um, uh, whose name I can't remember, um, uh, the founder of the uh, of the of the of the Mormon Church. Um, uh, well, he came after jo Joseph Smith was, I guess, the the originator who the, had the seer stones. But um, I'll think of his name in a minute. But anyhow, um, this heretic was going to go and publish a adulterated version of the Book of Mormon, which would have been, I guess, uh, considered disastrous by the Church of Latter Day Saints in the United States because the tenets of the theology would not be the same. Uh, that inconsistency was uh, not acceptable to the church. And so what they had to do is they had to go to uh, England. Um, I'm trying to remember the fellow's name. I'm, I'm blanking on it. Uh, uh, it's Utah. And um, the original. Uh, thank you, Brigham Young. Um, I feel better now. It was going to drive me crazy. Brigham Young was in England, and he had to go down to um, uh, register uh, the, the copyright at Stationers Hall, which is, by the way, where the Queen has to go uh, in order to register her trademark uh, to the King James Bible. Uh, and um, uh, of course, he won the race, Brigham Young actually and, and his partner, uh, won the race to Stations Hall, and the religion was saved because uh, they obtained the trademark in London, uh, in Britain, and um, when the heretic came to publish uh, their, um, their um, antith antithetical version of the Book of Mormon, whatever it was, however, why, ever, why it was uh, offensive, I don't know, but they were stopped. Uh, and again, uh, they, the Book of, uh, or the Church of Latter-day Saints was, uh, was, uh, was saved. Um, there it is. There's the slide I was looking for. Um, Brigham Young, who was the president of the church and a fellow by uh, the name of, uh, I think it's Herbert uh, Kimball uh, and Parley Pratt. These people have the strangest names. Um, they were serving in a mission when um, the Book of Mormon, uh, or the Church of Latter-day Saints in the United States advised them about how it was important for them to uh, go over and get the copyright. And so they went uh, to Stationers Hall and uh, registered it. Uh, and what treaty was it, or what, uh, what law was it that they, um, that, uh, that they registered this under, and which the queen registered uh, uh, the uh, copyright to the, um, uh, to the King James Bible? Yeah. Bingo, exactly. Queen Anne's Law. Remember the law that was passed in 1710, where they came to the queen and they said, Jesus, uh, we've got a problem here. Um, they're stealing my uh, creative work, and uh, Queen Anne um, uh, had uh, a Parliament uh, pass a, uh, a law called Queen Anne's Law. Uh, has a much longer name, but uh, uh, that that law is still in, in force and effect in um, uh, in Great Britain. Um, by the way, um, um, a recently found document uh, published in 2016 in uh, the papers of Joseph Smith, who you mentioned. Um, reports a revelation, uh, some communication that Joseph Smith had with God in which God said, uh, obey the copyright laws. Uh, according to the papers of Do uh, Joseph Smith, and I thought this quote was uh, interesting coming from a supreme being, uh, be diligent in securing the copyright of my work upon all the face of the earth of which is known by you that the faithful and the righteous may retain the temporal blessing as well as the spiritual. God is not, I didn't know God was in the habit of giving legal advice, but I couldn't give better legal advice myself. That's exactly what all owners of creative works need to do. Um, you all need to be diligent in securing copyright protection for your, um, for your um, inventions and your creative works. By the way, uh, let's not confuse the Book of Mormon with the Book of Mormon. Um, separate copyright, separate trademark, 
Why is the Book of Mormon, the play, able to use the title, the Book of Mormon? They're both same name. Wouldn't that create confusion in the minds of the public? Of course not. One's a farce, one's a comedy, one's a satire, and the other one is a play. I, yeah, I, 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 if I have to explain my jokes, you know, then, then you don't belong in this school. That's all I can say. Yes, sir. So it's not trademarked because it can't be used for, it's not used for commercial purposes? It is trademarked. Uh, well, both the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the name, uh, is trademarked by the Church of Latter-day Saints, and uh, it's copyrighted. But um, this is also copyrighted and trademarked. But as I tried to imply with my humor, there's a difference in uh, substance between the two. One is a text that describes the, uh, the theological tenets of a, of a religion, and the other one is a Broadway play that, uh, although it borrows uh, uh, from the religion, is um, uh, an attempt at satire and humor uh, at that religion's expense. And by the way, uh, which will, I'm getting ahead of myself uh, because this is tomorrow's lecture, but um, there's doubt in my mind that they would have to, have to uh, separately trademark or copyright this, although it's separately protectable. It's perfectly appropriate to use the name of the Book of Mormon or the King James Bible or uh, Science and Health with, with Key to the Scriptures um, for satirical purposes. It's called fair use. And so one of the things that Congress decided and the courts have decided is that it's important in this society for us to be able to make fun of institutions, uh, to, make, um, uh, to, to make light of religions or politicians or other public figures. And so while those entities own their images, that, is, that does not make them immune from satire uh, or humor or uh, being made fun of um, or criticism. Um, trademark, copyright, patents can't be used to prevent uh, criticism. Uh, that's called fair use. And we'll get into that a little bit tomorrow. So that other book, the Heretic book, yes. that doesn't qualify as that? No, because the heretic was serious. If, you know, if he had marketed as a, a satirical play, you know, I think, you know, if, uh, if you had been uh, his lawyer, you know, you might have advanced that theory. Um, but they didn't. Uh, this, was a, this was a serious contest between a group outside the church that thought they understood the teachings of the church uh, uh, and their disagreement with the, 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 the church elders. Yes, sir. Yes, Brian. With the um, case of Bambley Day last I think it was uh, I think it was Star Trek. Yep, moved in, tried to stop him, um, and of course the the argument in that case was that this isn't Star Wars or Star I think Star Trek, Star Wars, Star Trek, one or the other. This isn't Star Wars. This isn't, isn't Star Trek. This is a parody. The argument that uh, Star Wars or Star Trek made was that it may be a parody, but it infringes because the characters that you're using are so close, uh, in fact, are identical to the characters that we've created. And now, now I'm thinking that I think it was Star Trek because it was the Mr. Spock character, you know, the guy who was green from Vulcan who had a unique way of, uh, of speaking and it's the, you know, the whole logic thing. So, you know, the image that they were trying to, to protect or they say were entitled to protect was this character that they, that this, that this, uh, the, the, the personality that this character projected. And that's protectable. So if that's the case, um, 
why wouldn't Mel Brooks be sued for space balls or young practice on or any of these? Um, because, because they're sufficiently different. Um, they're, they're parodies uh, on top of parodies, um, the, but the originality requirement is satisfied. Um, there's something called the reasonable man test, uh, which is what they use in every case involving trademark and copyright. And what they do is they take the two works, and they put them up next to each other, and they compare them. And if, after that comparison, a reasonable man would conclude that they're substantially similar, and that's, that's another le legal term, substantially similar. Uh, if they're found under this reasonable man test to be substantially similar, that's an infringement. But if they're sufficiently different, if they project a different personality, if it's parody, if they look a little different, if they talk a little different, the more distance you put between the two of them, the less likely the reasonable man standard will find substantial similarity and an infringement. So you just have to, have to make them different, like a duck. You have to change, you have to change it. Um, this, um, this group, um, Scientology, is, has used um, copyright, trademark, uh, more than any other major religion uh, in order to enforce um, uh, or maintain control over its, um, uh, the, its teachings. Um, founded in 1954 by L. Ron Hubbard, so the copyright on Dianetics is still alive and well, um, uh, and Scientology uh, owns it, and believe you me, enforces it. Um, and, uh, you know, their, their whole um, intent is to guarantee uh, that Dianetics and Scientology cannot be misrepresented. Um, so L. Ron Hubbard, you know, I guess maybe following in the footsteps of John Smith, who spoke to an angel who told, them, told him to uh, be diligent, diligent about enforcing copyrights, L. Ron Hubbard, Hubble, Hubbard uh, copyrighted uh, uh, Dianetics. Uh, he wanted to, just like the angel uh, in the Book of uh, Mormon, uh, in speaking to uh, Joseph Smith, just like science and health and key to the scriptures, just like the queen when it comes to the King James Bible, the idea is controlling the theology, the image of the theology, the content of the theology. Um, and it, um, it, apl it applies to, to uh, all uh, religious texts, the Holy Koran. Um, again, a religion that takes a slightly different approach when it comes to uh, the sharing of information under the teaching of, of Islam, no one has a right to claim copyright on publishing, printing, and distributing the Koran uh, as far as content is concerned. So it, it's literally in the Koran that um, it's the word of God, and as the word of God, it belongs to, the, belongs to the world. No one has control over it. Fact is, there are dozens of uh, copyrighted versions of the Koran. So despite what uh, uh, Mohammed may have uh, said, uh, the fact is that there are dozens of different uh, translations of the original uh, Koran. Uh, when it was translated from classical Arabic into English, copyrighted. When it was subsequently published in another uh, edition with commentary uh, about the, uh, the, the content, the tenets contained in it, copyrighted. Again, the reason it can be separately corporate, incorporated, uh, 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 copyrighted, um, despite what the teachings of uh, Islam actually say, is because of the originality requirement. If you take the uh, classical Arab uh, Arabic version of the Quran and you translate it into English, that satisfies the originality requirement. Uh, so it's yours, at least for 70 years plus your lifetime. Uh, if you take the Quran and you uh, annot annotate it with footnotes and comments about the content, that su satisfies the originality content and you can publish it as yours and copyright it. It belongs to you for your lifetime in 70, 70 years. Um, 
Just finishing up, there's a, a couple of significant cases I wanted to mention to you. This uh, uh, Arantia Foundation uh, case uh, is a, a, a copyright infringement case. Um, it's it's notable uh, in this particular case, uh, or for our purposes, uh, it, it, while it seemed like a very simple copyright dispute, um, because it involved, again, religious, uh, one religious group after another. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. I think it was called, um, uh, let's see. Uh, anyhow, it was New Christian Fellowship versus uh, a, a, another group. It, it involved pen, Penguin Books and the, and the publication of a religious text. But when I, I talked earlier about how religious texts often uh, trace their origins according to their adherence to a deity, um, the court made note of that. Um, and with one sentence, uh, the court made it clear that its opinion will bear directly uh, on an issue that will arise in many future cases, especially when it comes to things like software. The court wrote, the copyright laws, of course, do not expressly require human authorship, and considerable controversy has arisen in recent years over the copyrightability of computer-generated works. That case held for the first time that computer-generated works are copyrightable used to have to be a person sitting at a keyboard, uh, writing code, and hitting save. Well, computer-generated works, uh, works generated by AI, are also copyrightable. So, uh, and the, I thought it was kind of a fun line. The court held that notwithstanding the spiritual book's celestial or divine origins, the originality requirement necessary for a valid copyright is satisfied because the human beings who compiled, selected, coordinated, and arranged the book did so in such a way that the resulting work as a whole constitute an original work of authorship. So it's the same, as, same concept that we've been talking about, but think about the computer code that often uh, you write in, in this school, anyhow, some of the core six people. Um, you can take a piece of software, you can rearrange it, improve it, and it's your own. And that legal principle was born out of a case involving a copyright infringement action involve, uh, uh, about a, a, spiritual, uh, a spiritual book. I think a, a very good example of how these, these principles apply across the board. So whether you're talking about uh, a religious text or whether you're talking about a piece of software, uh, the originality requirement is the same for them, same for everybody. All right. Tomorrow um, is fair use, uh, parody. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll have better jokes. Uh, but that will, um, see, I, you know, you did get my joke. I, I, I know you, you didn't like to laugh. It was one of those jokes that you didn't want to admit that you found funny. But you found it funny. I can see from up here. Anyhow, hopefully my jokes will be better. Tomorrow we're going to finish up copyright. It's the end of the, end of the game as far as copyright is concerned. And then next week uh, we're going to do patents, and I'm going to start by telling you the fascinating story uh, of graphene. Thanks a lot.